You'd have to have been living under a rock if you didn't know the world is facing an energy crisis at the moment, with gas and electricity prices, especially in the UK, skyrocketing. So of course, peeps are taking steps in order to cut down on their electricity usage. You know, stuff like LED light bulbs, smart plugs, that kind of thing. It's also been advised that we eliminate phantom power as much as possible. That's energy that's wasted around your home when devices are plugged in and using power, but you're not actively using them. Ah. But most of these are switched off. Surely they're not drawing that much power, right? Well, that's what this new series is setting out to answer. How much power has been used by all these consoles? How much are they costing us? And could we save money by switching them off at the mains? So, uh, hello fellow gamers and... Let's see how much money I've been burning. Alright, presuming I haven't already bored you to death, let's see how much each of these consoles are costing us. Now I've got a lot of consoles here, so I'll be covering this over several installments. In this episode, I'll be covering all of the consoles I have in the 2nd, 3rd, 4th and 5th generations. Now, a word of warning. Throughout the series, I'm going to be talking about kilowatt hours a lot. Reason being, that's how our electricity usage is measured by the electricity companies in the UK and, ultimately, the units by which we're charged at. This is going to result in a lot of wacky numbers being thrown around, but as soon as I show you what it means in sterling, it's going to make a lot more sense. So let's see how much these consoles are costing, and hopefully this might help you save a little money as well. We'll start off with one of the most retro of retro consoles. The Atari VCS, released in Europe in 1978. That's 44 years ago from the date of this video. So you might think it would draw an exceptional amount of power today. I mean, it's unlikely most people would still have one set up at home since, well, in a world of digital TV, HDMI and flat panels, a console that only works over RF wouldn't be all that desirable. And yet, I do! So, let's see how much this thing's costing me. Having the system switched on, running a game consumes about 0.004 kilowatt hours of power. That equates to about 0.1 pence per hour to run and play this console. So yeah, uh, that's surprisingly cheap. So, if you've got an Atari VCS and you want to play it on short stints, or heck, even on long stints, it's pretty much not going to make any difference to your electricity bill. Like, at all. If you were going to leave it switched on 24-7, that would equate to just under a pound a month. But no one leaves their console on, well, I mean on-on, all the time, do they? Instead, consoles are usually either left in a low-power standby state, or just simply switched off. And since the VCS doesn't have standby, I'm going to focus next on that last state, and this is where it gets quite surprising. Plugged in, but switched off, the Atari VCS uses a quarter of its power consumption when it's switched on, at 0.001 kilowatt hours. 0.001 kilowatt hours? That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Except, that's not exactly zero, is it? Per month, you're looking at close to 25 pence in electricity costs, and over the course of a year, that equates to just shy of three quid. And that's just when it's left plugged in and switched off. Not in use at all. Now, okay, uh, three quid over the course of a year. That's, well, nothing really, is it? Unless you're really strict at counting the pennies, most people could live with that. But this is exactly what phantom power is. Power drawn by household devices when they're not in use. And I bet you anything, you've got more than one in your home. Far more than one. So ultimately, with regards to the Atari VCS, I recommend just turning it off at the wall when it's not in use. We're moving up to the third generation of consoles now with my NES. This came out in Europe in 1986, and it's more likely a system that video game enthusiasts are going to have in their setup, despite it only having a mono AV output. Now getting straight to the point, the NES uses twice as much power as the Atari does when switched on and in use, a 0.008 kilowatt hours. Again, this is nothing to worry about when the system is in use, you can happily enjoy the likes of the original Super Mario Bros. 3, safe in the knowledge that it isn't going to cost you even 7 pence to run in the space of 24 hours. But, as I've already said, what's most important is what it costs when switched off. And again, in its off state it uses twice as much power as the Atari VCS at 0.002 kWh. That works out as 6 quid a year, just left plugged in and switched off, not in use whatsoever. Now, given how the NES doesn't have the benefit of a standby mode, again, 
I'd recommend just switching this off at the wall when it's not in use. We're on to my fourth generation consoles now, and, of course, it makes sense to move on from the NES to its successor, 1992's Super Nintendo. Well, at least where my own setup is concerned, anyway. The Super Nintendo draws a little more power than its predecessor when it switched on, at 0.01 kilowatt hours. But again, all things considered, this is a drop in the ocean. Playing an original SNES for a solid 24 hours will cost you a measly 8 pence in electricity. And this was measured while playing Star Wing, the very first game that included the Super FX chip, which undoubtedly introduces an additional power draw all of its own. Switched off, however, it matches the NES's power draw at 0.002 kilowatt hours. So having this plugged in and switched off all the time is going to cost you another six pounds a year. Once again, as a system that doesn't include and wouldn't even benefit from a standby option, I'd also recommend switching this off at the wall whenever you're not using it. Sega's Mega Drive is next up, and in my setup, I have the Mega Drive 2 connected. Sega's 1993 variant of their 16-bit system apparently uses less power than the original. So if you're using a different model of the Mega Drive, be aware that the numbers I'm about to quote may well differ from what yours might be, but I imagine they wouldn't stray very far. Impressively, the Mega Drive 2 has a power draw that's ever so slightly less than the NES. It uses 0.007 kilowatt hours when switched on and playing a game, and like with the Super Nintendo, this was measured using a game that likely included an additional power draw thanks to an additional graphics chip included in the cartridge. I'm of course talking about virtual racing. So if one day you decided to do a 24 hour F1 marathon on the Mega Drive 2, you'd be happy to know that it'll only cost you 6 pence in electricity. <laughs> what a bargain! The Mega Drive 2 is even more surprisingly conservative with its power usage when it's switched off. Again, it draws less power than the NES at 0.001 kilowatt hours, something more akin to what the old Atari draws. Now this works out as another three quid a year if simply left plugged in, but seeing as we'd just be wasting money leaving it as it is, it would be best to turn this one off at the mains as well if you want to save as much as you can. With the fourth generation of consoles out of the way, we paved the way for the fifth, and the Sega Saturn was the first of these to come out back in 1995 at least in my collection. And naturally, as the system is considerably more powerful than anything that came before it, it also draws more power when it's in use. When testing this out with Sega Rally, the Saturn drew 0.011 kilowatt hours. That works out as nine pence in electricity if you decided to have a full day's worth of rallying, which again is a drop in the ocean, all things considered. In contrast to what we've seen already, that's nearly three times as much power as the good old Atari VCS, which came out 17 years prior. But it's when the Saturn is switched off where we're greeted with a welcome surprise. When the Saturn is plugged in and switched off, it draws absolutely nothing from the mains. Or should I say, if it was drawing anything at all, it was so incredibly minute that it didn't even register on my power meter. So with this, I'd say it's not going to make a difference if you turn this off at the wall or not. This is likely one of the systems that you can simply leave plugged in indefinitely. Shortly after the release of the Saturn came Sony's first foray in the video gaming industry, the PlayStation. But did they give any thought to the power usage of the console? Well, testing out my original PlayStation with Wipeout, it used up a total of 0.007 kilowatt hours, which is in the same vein as the Mega Drive 2 from the previous generation, and less power than the Super Nintendo and even the NES from two generations prior. That means playing for long periods of time will mean you're only using about six pence of electricity per day. That's two thirds of the power usage of the Saturn when in use. Now, as nice as it is to see how well the PS1 conserved power compared to its competitor whilst in use, it's quite a different story when it's not. The PlayStation, like with most other consoles before it, draws power even when it's switched off. I was able to measure 0.001 kilowatt hours whilst mine was switched off. Now, we can applaud Sony for keeping power usage for their first console as low as the old Atari VCS from nearly two decades previous. That still means it's costing money in the long run. Another three quid a year, in fact. So if given the choice whether to turn this off at the wall or not, I'd say do it. The last console of the fifth generation in my collection is, of course, the Nintendo 64, the most powerful console of its time. So with that extra power, does that mean additional power intake? 
Now, given how power usage could potentially differ on a system like the N64, you know, given cartridges could have different capacities, different chipsets, and whether the games themselves needed the expansion pack or not, I decided to test the N64 with Perfect Dark. It's a game that came out late in its lifetime, it's known to push the system, and it requires the expansion pack to even play properly. So hopefully, using this, it will make the N64 draw the maximum amount of power it possibly could. You know, if it even makes a difference. Nonetheless, I managed to measure a total of 0.009 kilowatt hours out of the system, which sits it squarely between the PlayStation and the Saturn, and that's less than its predecessor, the Super Nintendo. Wait a minute, so it costs less to play Perfect Dark on an N64 than it does to play Star Wing on a Super Nintendo. Well, that's not too shabby, is it? But something else that's really nice about the N64 is something that it also shares with the Saturn. When switched off, it draws nothing, or at least next to nothing, from the mains. So it's really not costing you anything at all when left plugged in and switched off. You needn't worry too much about having to turn this off at the wall at all. Now that would be the end of it for now, except we have alternative ways of playing many of these consoles, and that just complicates things further. The NES, SNES, Mega Drive and PlayStation all have micro console variations that came out over the last few years. They all run a selection of games from each of these platforms, all output in 720p over HDMI, and all of them run off straightforward USB. Now, I'm not an electrical engineer, so I can't be sure if I've got the numbers right. But if I have, playing games on one of these may well work out a damn sight cheaper than playing them on their aging originals. Take the NES Classic, for example. When switched on and playing a game, I was measuring 4.93 volts and 0.23 amps. And when we throw mass into the equation and work out its kilowatt hour usage, we get a grand total of... <coughs> 0.001339 kilowatt hours. That's a ridiculously low number, isn't it? That's 0.04 pence per hour. That's less than a penny a day. And if you left it switched on all year round, three pounds, 38 pence per year. So wait a minute, that's cheaper than having the original NES plugged in and turned off, doing sweet FA. And to further sweeten the deal, when switched off, the amps drop off entirely. No amps means it isn't costing a penny while they're switched off. And it's a similar story with the rest of the micro consoles. Although the voltage and amperage varied between each of them, they all drew far less power than the original consoles on which they're based on. In fact, the SNES Classic as well draws less power switched on than its original did when switched off. So in short, if you have both the originals and the micro consoles, and as much as I hate to say this, you know, as a purist, you'll want to switch to using the more recent micro consoles instead if you're concerned about your electricity bills. Just be sure to keep the system's auto shutdown switched on, you know, just in case you happen to forget to turn it off. Psst. Hey, if you don't like the games that are on them, you could always mod them and put your own games on. You didn't hear that from me. So in summary, after checking the power usage of all of these consoles, I could stand to save about 21 quid per year on my electricity bills by selectively unplugging some of them. I could stand to save even more if I change over to using the micro consoles instead. Now, I know that's not a lot, but that's just the first batch. There's loads of others here that I need to check to see where else we can save some pennies. If you want to see how those turn out, perhaps to help out even with your own rising bills, feel free to subscribe. And with that, I'm going to head off because well, I've got quite a bit of power management to sort out. Thanks very much for watching though, and I really hope that this has helped you be a little more conscious with your power usage, and especially with your consoles. Please leave a like if you like the video, and I'll catch you all next time.